Hello, and welcome to How to Be Orange, the audiobook experience. I enjoyed writing the book, I certainly enjoyed reading it, and I hope you enjoy listening to it. Go to youtube.com slash Greg Shapiro and subscribe to my channel, and then you can click on the playlist. Enjoy. How to Be Orange, Chapter 10, Pain Tolerance. The quote. All the criminals and drug addicts in Europe have gone and exploited the openness in Amsterdam. Amsterdam is a mess. The O'Reilly Factor, Fox News. Quote, two, Dutch doctors prescribe the least amount of antibiotics in Europe. De Volkskrant. In America, we're pretty sure that all Dutch people are drug-dealing, drug-doing, baby-killing, grandpa-murdering homosexuals. Yet, if that was true... Then you could get drugs from, say, the Dutch healthcare system, which is virtually impossible. My grandpa used to watch Fox News. He'd call us up and ask, are you doing okay over there? As if to say, how do you manage to survive? I'd tell him to relax and watch that YouTube video, Fox News in Amsterdam. It does an excellent job of listing drug abuse, murder, and suicide as American problems more than Dutch. And then my grandpa would go further. But I hear you've got socialized medicine over there. You can't even see a doctor if you want to. And that's when I'd have to set the record straight. Seeing a doctor is not a problem. The problem is getting the doctor to do anything... Most countries have doctors swear an oath, some version of the Hippocratic Oath. In Nederland, there seems to be a different oath. As much as possible, I will tell my patients, why don't you go home and get some rest? It is not uncommon to begin and end your doctor visit like this. I have a head cold. Why don't you go home and get some rest? I have a chest cold. Why don't you go home and get some rest? I have a head cold, and because I was waiting so long in your waiting room, I now also have a chest cold. Also, I'm suffering from acute depression since no one is taking me seriously, and my arm was bitten off by a squid. I'm losing a lot of blood. Why don't you go home and get some rest? The frustrating thing for an American is this. Often, the advice is absolutely correct. For me, staying home from work and healing myself has worked every time. And imagine if I'd have a job that paid me for sick days. But as an American, I want the option to pump myself full of antibiotics and keep on working. My wife continues to tease me about it. My wife has such an antipathy for drugs that she gave birth to two babies with nothing but deep breathing. My family in America still doesn't believe it. But when did you have the epidural? We didn't. But what kind of anesthesia did you use? Nothing. Are you doing okay over there? Granted, we could have gone for a hospital birth if we'd wanted it. When my wife opted for natural childbirth, that was one of my first questions. Refreshingly, the midwife assured me that she was not anti-drug, she was just pro-nature. We were told if there's anything wrong at any point, that's when we go to the hospital. We did end up going to the hospital at one point, which convinced me not to trust the hospital. About a month before the due date of our first child, my wife got a strange feeling. Normally, she'd be feeling the baby move or kick every day, but there were a couple of days in a row that she felt nothing. As a first-time mother, she got super nervous. So, on a Sunday, we decided to go to the hospital. If I can recommend a day of the week to go to a Dutch hospital, I would not recommend a Sunday. Even if my wife had been giving birth, I think they would have asked, ooh, could you hold it in and come back tomorrow? We were told that there was only one obstetrician on duty, and there was another woman already in labor, so we'd just have to wait. I explained that my wife was super nervous, we just needed a quick consultation, just someone in a uniform to tell us everything was okay. We waited. While the obstetrician was busy, we were visited by an obstetrician in training. She showed us into a room, and we explained again that we were super nervous. She made an ultrasound scan of the baby and paused as she held the wand over my wife's belly. Then we got that famous Dutch bedside manner. Either I'm reading this wrong, or your baby has birth defects. It could be a misshapen head. I'll go get the doctor now and be gone for as long as possible. 
We were scared stiff. She literally left me holding the ultrasound wand in my hand. I decided to keep smiling. I thought I'd make the best of it. What the hell? I'll give myself an ultrasound. I introduced my wife to my food baby. That helped us calm down a little, but it felt like forever before the proper obstetrician came in. Without a word to us, he instructed the trainee that you're supposed to measure the line from the inside, not the outside. And he left, still without a word or even eye contact with us. The trainee said, your baby's fine. And I felt much better about having the baby at home. Then the day came. The water broke. At this point in the story, my family wanted to know, how did you get to the hospital? We didn't. But who delivered the baby? The midwife came to us. In an ambulance? No, in an old Volvo. Are you doing okay over there? Now, to tell the truth, we were supposed to go to the hospital. When the water broke, it wasn't totally clean, and that means that you're supposed to have breathing machines nearby just in case. I watched as the midwife called the hospital and was told there was no space. Why? It was a Saturday. The midwife continued dialing. My wife continued dilating. The midwife found another hospital. Again, no space. Finally, she found an open spot at Sloterfart Hospital, the same one that said maybe the baby was deformed. But my wife had already dilated to eight centimeters. The midwife and I looked at each other and silently did the math. To an American, eight centimeters doesn't sound so big but multiply that times the three flights of stairs we'd have to descend to get to the street, and then what? I couldn't believe there was no plan for this. We could call an ambulance, or maybe would it just be faster with her Volvo? Or a taxi? I actually thought a taxi might want to take us. For the record, according to the list of least desirable passengers, pregnant woman is right up there between vomiting vagrant and bleeding junkie. In my desperation, I even thought of our normal mode of transport, the bike. Of course, I didn't expect my wife would have to ride herself, but part of me seriously considered taking my wife on the back of my bike. Somehow, I pictured the midwife biking along beside us, yelling, Pull your knees up! Keep breathing! And if worse came to worse and a scooter would try to pass us, I'd just hijack it. As it turns out, we didn't make it out of the bedroom. We had our first baby on our bed. No anesthetic, no defects, no complications. And then, as directed, we went and got some rest. Our second baby was an even more touchy-feely experience. The water broke, and again, the amniotic fluid wasn't clear. And this time, it was a Monday. Surely we could get into a hospital on time. Not even close. Everything this time went much faster. This time we used what is called a birthing stool, which allows your baby to be born with the help of gravity. So instead of push, push, our midwife had to say, hold it in, hold it in. Our second midwife's name was Dor, a uniquely perfect name in either language. As the baby was crowning, she was busy with some special pillow. My wife remembers it as one of our pillows with a garbage bag around it. Dor was getting ready to catch the baby as it fell naturally out of the womb. She and her assistant were in the room, but they weren't ready yet. I was standing behind my wife, who was doing her best to slow things down. But at one point, gravity took over. My wife said, I can't hold it in anymore. I could only watch as Dor grabbed the pillow and dived to make a spectacular catch. She went all out. I can see her diving in slow motion and door, not my baby, hit the floor. What followed was a kind of shamanistic gore fest. The midwife's assistant stepped in and made a whole production out of the afterbirth. With bravado, she said, wait, there's more, and proceeded to do an imitation of the magician pulling handkerchiefs out of a sleeve. She pulled until she reached the placenta, 
but no one was there to catch that. The placenta hit the floor, and the blood sprayed all over the walls like a special effect in a horror movie. The midwife's assistant then gingerly picked up the placenta and cradled it in her arms. It was like a little competition. Midwife Dor was with our baby, saying, Oh, it's a boy. He's beautiful. And next to her was the assistant, looking at the placenta, saying, Oh, look at these beautiful textures. Did you know the placenta weighs as much as the baby? You made this with your body. You did this. Kijk, mooie vliesen, mooie moederkoek. Yes, the Dutch word for placenta is moederkoek, or mother cookie. I've made my peace with terms like shame hair, but mother cookie was a bit much for me. I couldn't help thinking, how could you invent such a term? Was there someone long ago who was ready for a post-birth snack? And right on cue, the assistant asked, do you want to keep it? My wife and I both stared at her for a full 10 seconds before I volunteered, what? The assistant explained, De Mutterkook. Some people like to keep it. I wanted to know why. Are there really people who eat it? Is it a Dutch thing that I don't know about? Maybe I don't want to know. But my wife was looking at me over her shoulder saying, well, I don't know. Maybe we'll want to keep it. Maybe we could plant a tree with it. As I watched my newborn son being neglected, it occurred to me, let's not have this discussion now. Sometimes just give the people what they want. I told the assistant, fine, wrap it up. We'll take it. And for months afterward, if you'd come to our house and drop in for dinner, we'd be ready. We'd just have to look in the freezer. Would you like fish sticks, maybe frozen pizza? Or if you ever want to try some mother cookie... To this day, I have never managed to get myself antibiotics from a Dutch doctor. Although we came close with my daughter one time. She was just a few years old and she had an ear infection. We took her to our doctor who told us, why don't you go home and get some rest? We protested, no one is getting any rest. Our daughter is screaming in pain. Her mama is not sleeping. I'm not sleeping. We need medicine. We were recommended some over-the-counter cream it was at this point that we decided to try alternative medicine, the homeopathic doctor. The new doctor started out with another typical Dutch doctor phrase, What do you think is the problem? We think our daughter has an ear infection. I looked at the doctor who said, You are right. I half expected to win a prize. Then comes the next question, And what would you like me to do? I've heard this question more than once from Dutch doctors. What do you think I should do? It's not the best way to inspire confidence. My first reaction is always, you're the doctor, don't you know? But looking at it another way, if a doctor asks, what do you think I should do? Asking your opinion like you're some medical expert, I suppose it really is quite a compliment. I summoned up the manner of a doctor who'd been studying pediatrics for years and I offered my advice, well, I think we'd like some medicine. The doctor quickly determined the root of the problem, an outer ear infection on her right side and an inner ear infection on the left side. We were given two prescriptions. Both had magically illegible scribbles, and we looked on in awe as the woman at the pharmacy actually seemed to understand what they meant. But we were taken aback when she delivered the medicine, tea tree oil and zerodruples. We thought this might be a mistake, but no. Nope. The woman explained that the tea tree oil was for the outer ear infection and the sour drops were for the inner ear. At home, we wrestled our poor child into position and administered the chamomile tea tree oil first in with the cotton ball and then the flip over and the sour vinegar drops into the other ear. It was then that it occurred to my wife, we're mixing oil and vinegar in our daughter's head. And she wasn't getting healthier very quickly, but when she sneezed, the salad dressing tasted great. The Netherlands is a country where you can get smart drugs over the counter, no problem. And with a weed pass, hash over the counter, no problem. But if you want to get antibiotic medicine to heal your body, Dutch people say, get out of here, you sick, disgusting freak.